Thanks for subscribing and listening to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In this episode, number 202, we get to talk with Dr. Sorka Nee Lane, editor and contributor to Clive Barker Dark Imaginer, a compilation of academic essays that span Clive's work from the 80s all the way to the Scarlet Gospels. Uh, you might be able to imagine how fun it was for Jose and I to have a long chat with, with a professor about our favorite subject, Clive. All right, well, here we are. Uh, this is episode 202 of the Clive Barker podcast, and we're talking with uh, Dr. Sorka Nee Line of, uh, and, and you have, you've, we've got a, a, a recent paperback release of your book, uh, Clive Barker, Dark Imaginer. Hello. Yes, hey. it's lovely to be, lovely to talk to you both about this. This is great. So uh, before and before we get into that book, I, I'm I'm just gonna assume make the assumption that you were probably a Clive Barker fan before you got into uh, scholarly um, uh, works on him. So what was your first experience? Uh, your the first thing that made you a Clive Barker fan? Oh wow, that's a great question. Probably actually, it was probably an experience I had when I was quite young, and I wasn't I didn't put the two things together, but um, I worked and hung around a lot in video stores in the 1980s and I worked in them in the 1990s and 2000s and I always remember Hellraiser in particular because of that great video box cover uh -huh. and it always kind of drew me in the fascination of it you know and I remember um uh, I mean I, I work a lot in horror studies and gothic and horror studies is my expertise my area of expertise and I remember as a kid, it was that the feeling of fascination, that look of the cover and, and you know, the glory sort of of Pinhead's face and the terror. There was a kind of a really interesting kind of free song going on there. So um, I, I, I remember studying the video box in, in, in a lot of detail, even though I dare not watch it. I was very young. And then... Um, I suppose the first time I got into reading him would have been about when I was about maybe 14. I definitely remember buying secondhand copies of um, Hellbound Heart and Cabal. And um, and then probably the first novel attempt I had reading his maybe would have been in Magica. I mm. found it quite hard going as a teenager, I must say. I found a Magica quite tough, <laughs> but um, it was it's. I don't think it's the one to start with. <laughs> no. I, I had that um, same experience. I, I thought it was too many characters to keep track of my first go yeah, around. It's a very dense book in terms of, you know, it's kind of secondary world and its complexities and stuff. It's quite dense, really. Um, yeah. But then I, I'm just trying to think. I remember around the time I started buying his books as they came out, it probably would have been Galilee would have been the first one I would have bought in hardback. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of retrospectively kind of fleshed it out. But I became kind of aware of them. I also remember, and this is quite funny, but in the Imagica uh, paperback that I did have, there was a beautiful inset um, fo photo of Clive in it. And it's kind of that famous uh, portrait of him from about 1992. And I remember thinking, wow, for a horror writer, he's exceptionally beautiful looking. Um, <laughs> that was, that was a, you know, that was a thrill. I mean, you know, even, even today talking with colleagues were like, Clive Barker wins the most handsome, most attractive horror writer without question. I mean, <laughs> nobody talks this way about, you know, Stephen King. So, um, so this was something that kind of collated or kind of came together for me, um, all these different kind of events, but that was my, probably my first experience. So, between Pinhead and, of course, discovering his literature. Yeah, I think those two, kind of two things. So it informed my teenage life, uh, you know, quite considerably. Wonderful. So this book was published by the Manchester University Press, and um, it was edited by you. And it features, um, apart from an introduction, it's split within three parts. And um, for our listeners who haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, so part one is about... Um, the uh, 80s, uh, London, you know, the mm -hmm. Thatcher years and how that affected uh, some of the stories in the Books of Blood and some of the themes that Clyde Barker approaches in his stories. And then in um, in part two, it goes more into the movies, uh, Clyde Barker's movies and um, the adaptations okay. that were done from his work. And then part three is about... Clyde Barker's queerness in his stories, um, you know, uh, the queerness of his monsters, uh, how he represents uh, blackness in um, in uh, his work and stuff like that. And then you uh, open and close this book with two essays. And um, I feel like 
if someone out there wants to know more about Clive Barker or who he is and they don't know, these two essays will give you a pretty complete summary of what his career has been like and what his major themes are. So I thought those those two essays were very, very uh, detailed, and uh, I had a really, really good time reading this book. It taught me oh, so much. That's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, that was kind of the idea I was coming up with this book. I mean, this book is a long time in the gestation. Um, I'm sure when if you read it, it's I do talk about that in the acknowledgments that it took many years to kind of birth this monstrous baby. Um, but it, it is about this idea that if you if you pick up, uh, if you want to understand what Clive is all about, uh, and I mean, this book only covers obviously elements of his career. I didn't look at, uh, for instance, his uh, his career in theatre or anything like that, or, or, or even much on the Dog Company. I know, I'm sure Sarah and Phil are covering that in detail if they haven't done so already. Oh, yeah. um, so the idea was to actually produce a piece of scholarship that um, addresses Barker pretty much not only in the 80s, but beyond the 80s, because that was one of the issues we had, uh, certainly I had, um, when this book, this book grew out of a conference I ran in 2011. I can talk to you about that in more detail if you like. But um, sure. one of the things I discovered was that um, Clive's work everyone who was referring to Clive's work was referring to material from the 80s or potentially the early 1990s. Yeah. And this was a really big problem because I kind of thought, well, hang on, I'm still buying his books. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm yeah. watching his movies. I'm watching adaptations of his stories. Um, and nobody's really talking about this in scholarship. There'd be one or two uh, articles or, or chapters maybe here and there. But really, as someone whose name was as in, you know, considered as influential at one point as Stephen King, it was amazing how much the how much of a gap there was in the scholarship around his work. So I wanted to produce a book um, that would really address those gaps. And also, if you were a Barker fan but didn't necessarily just appreciate the books of blood, um, that you could just pick this up and find something in there for you. So that was that was the idea. So. Um, so that kind of brought to life this book, but also um, the conference in which it was uh, initially uh, emanated from was uh, one I ran back in 2011, so before your podcast started. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I very, we were very fortunate. I, I, I ran it in Trinity College Dublin, which is uh, which is where I, I did my doctoral study, and um, I was got, I got the great great support of the university to do this because my own mentor had was also a big Barker fan, but we kind of both of us had kind of had these conversations where we were like, what's what's going on with him? Wonder what he's doing nowadays? Because I was I knew he was doing Aberat and stuff, but I didn't know what else. Uh, was out there that um, and other people who wanted to talk about Barker in any detail. So I put out this conference and uh, and I wrote to Clive, and Clive was very very generous and said I would really love to uh, to come at your invitation. I, I invited him over thinking he won't he won't say yes, and he did. So. Um, uh, I was very, very fortunate that Clive was able to participate in the conference. He gave us two plenary talks, so two talks to the uh, to the to all the attendees at the conference, talking uh, one day about his art and another day about his sort of his legacy, the literature, the film, the whole experience of, uh, of his career to date. And um, we were very, very fortunate to have that experience with him um, because I know he hasn't, this was about maybe, God, about maybe seven or eight months before he had, he was quite sick. Mm -hmm. um yeah, had the issue with his dentistry so um thankfully um we were able to get him while he's still willing to travel in europe which was which was really special so um it was a wonderful time and i think it really helped us realize or helped me realize anyway as an editor that there were people out there who were very interested in talking about clive's work and legacy um and and that they were um still looking at it from an academic point of view. It wasn't just back to the 1980s material. So, uh, right. so yeah, it came together under lots of fantastic circumstances. Yeah, um, because by, by that time, the only two major academic works about Clive Barker were um, Gary Hoppenstand's Clive Barker's mm -hmm. short stories, Imagination as Metaphor in the Books of Blood, um, and uh, Writing Horror in the Body, uh, the fiction of Stephen yeah. King, Clive Barker, and Anne Rice. So those were pretty much the only ones that I had in my collection. And, uh, and there's that unfortunately, uh, Suzanne yeah. J. Barbieri, um, Mythmaker for the Millennium one, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the first publication of the British uh, Fantasy Society, yes. I think, right? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I have a copy of that book as well. And that's a very, very good primer for a Barker reader. I mean, obviously it was, I think it was published around 2000. So, I mean, but it, it, it's a very good primer for um, introducing yourself to Barker. Hoppenstein's book is absolutely brilliant. Um, I mean, I, obviously it does take a particular sort of emphasis on books of blood but uh, he does have this wonderful section at the end where he talks about the major themes and ideas and moods in Barker's mm -hmm. work and um and Hoppinson is such a fabulous writer he's a beautiful writer um that it, I think it's quite extraordinary what he's managed to produce there um and it was very influential all of the scholars that have contributed to this book have probably referenced Hoppinson because it was such an important contribution to the kind of study of Barker but Patty's book is brilliant. It's kind of this wonderful two-hander because she had another book out called um, uh, Horror and the Body Fantastic, I think it was, and mm -hmm. uh, which makes mess. You know, does kind of talk about Barker, but this um, this this wonderful kind of duet of books that she produced uh, looks at kind of horror in the mid 1990s. And you would think from reading those books that Barker was going to explode outwards the way King did, and the fact that it didn't happen, I think. Um, is, is really interesting because uh, because Clive went in a different direction and while I think and I think that's cost him a lot as well as actually been yeah. something very important in his career I think it's cost him in the way of the popular commerciality that you expect with someone like um, uh, I don't know Straub or well maybe not Straub but King certainly Rowling it, it, yeah it's really interesting because that, that's something that we struggle with too it's like in the 90s everybody knew who Clive Barker was but now, sure. you know, now they don't. I mean, in somebody on the somebody I meet, you know, says, "Oh, you do a podcast. What's it about?" And it takes mm. a long time to explain, you know, explain something that I think should be, you know, everybody should remember. But I don't know. I, I have that with my students. Um, we were like, "Who's this Clive Barker guy?" And I'm like, "Well, do you know?" I mean, I usually find the easiest way to do it because they're students of film. I usually say, to them, "Like, well, okay, Pinhead, the guy with the pins in his face," and they're like, yep. "Oh yeah." I'm like, "Right, that's a Clive Barker film that was written by an author called Clive Barker. Go check it out." And usually, when they do, um, they come back and go, "That was brilliant." I'm like, "Exactly." So go and read more of his material, kids. He is. Uh, I made a very conscious decision to include Barker's um, Hellraiser and also Damnation Game on uh, our uh, master's program in uh, the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies. I wanted to reclaim him and do everything I could to make sure that people would continue to read his work. So uh, I'm doing my best, but I, com I completely appreciate that, you know, not everyone knows who he is. And that's uh, that's a real shame. I, you know? I, I, like... wish, I wish that I had you as a professor when I was in college. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to go back to... Uh... <laughs> I would like to go back to something you said earlier about how there seems to be a gap um, in academic analysis of Clive Barker's work. And I, I think it's interesting in your introduction, you bring up um, the fact that Clive Barker uh, is a transdisciplinary figure for scholarly inqu inquiry, a polymath mm -hmm. in a continuous state of creating and imagining new worlds, creatures and stories and finding new ways to tell them. Uh, do you think that his inability to stay too long in a single form, the fact that he started with horror, matured into fantasy, ultimately moved to young adult and children's books, and then, of course, he started painting? I mean, he always he always painted and drew uh, even before he wrote. But then he started doing Aberat that is very art intensive and then photography and drawing. Maybe that's a bit in, uh, influential on the lack of academic analysis because of the variety of genres and media that he's touched over the years. I think so. I think it's to do with that kind of idea of, I mean, Clive is such a, he's such an extraordinary person in terms of his creative output. I mean, he seems to, to not be able to stay still for very long. So if he's not photographing something or sketching something or writing something or whatever, he's he's constantly on the move. And that makes, well, his, I'm sure his interior creative life is very rich as a result of that. In terms of the commercial aspects of getting out there to an audience, it can be a bit fractured or a bit, um, a bit difficult to kind of consolidate. Um, one of the things I thought that was really interesting about um, trying to bring that together was it, it, the essential Clive Barker when that came out about 1998, mm -hmm. I think yeah. it was was I thought that was a really good way of kind of introducing someone to the extraordinary difference in his work or the um the kind of trans generic kind of um possibilities because it goes from things like uh sections of weave world all the way through to um you know uh thief of always and little snatches of things that you can see how he 
you can go across different audiences. Um, but a lot of people who are, especially scholars, who might be working on literature or film might not necessarily want to or feel comfortable going into looking at some of his avant-garde theatre or indeed the paintings. So um, I found that it kind of, if you can go into a bookshop and look and find Barker in three different places for three different audiences, that's a really good thing on a creative level. But in a commercial level, it can be very difficult to consolidate it. And especially when his name became synonymous with a particular type of splatter punk horror in the 1980s, mm-hmm. um, you might, I mean, some people, I wouldn't have a problem with it, but they might have paused then in buying mm-hmm. a YA book for their kid, yeah. wondering, hmm, is this something that I want to give my kid? Um, I mean, right. obviously, the material is all very different, but, uh, you know, there are certain, I think, uh, commercial prejudices that work there as well. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And also, um, Clive's creative output is so large that mm-hmm. as his his creative output is uh, draw, uh, driven by his artistic vision, and it's not so much subject to what the market wants or what the fans want. It's more like what he wants to do at the time. So even though he may have hundreds and hundreds of paintings, uh, we may not get to see all of them just because there's so many of them that it's hard to put them all in a book. I know Phil and Sarah are trying their best to do that with um, the uh, uh, Imaginer series of books uh, that represent his paintings. Uh, but there's still, when you go to his studio, like like we visited, and you see all the canvases there, and you, you realize the size, the sheer size of his output is so large that there's going to be stuff we probably will never be able to see because there won't be any way to um, publish all of that. Uh, and uh, it makes me sad and it makes me amazed at the same time that uh, there's so much stuff, so many manuscripts that are left unfinished uh, over at uh, Clyde Barker studio. And um, I just want to go in there and <laughs> and spend like a whole week just reading stuff and looking at the paintings just because uh, there's no other way for me to experience that stuff that's still there. You know, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the way to talk, um, I suppose the way I would look at it is that there's something really positive about that as well, though, which is that he's obviously not always happy with the material. So he might not be willing to have it published or have it, you know, uh, released into the open, into the world, yeah. I suppose. So the thing that's in that makes me think that's amazing is that um, some of his works are continually in process. And that means that he's working away on them and developing them according to his vision. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, we we may one day see a whole range of material released or, or 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 published, whether they're finished or unfinished, and that's fine because I'd rather have him choose his very best or his material that matters the most to him to have published, and of then course. discover the other materials later rather than thinking he's not produced anything. I'm sure he's produced lots. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. It, it, to me, it's I suppose. Like, I mean, I suppose it's like any writer of any type of um, any type of genre, um, you know, the amount of pain you go through to get the right draft out. Um, I don't want people to see my early drafts. I'd like them to see my final drafts. So as far as I'm concerned, I understand that that means that sometimes writing a novel or writing any kind of book is a, a painful birthing process. So uh, mm-hmm. I appreciate that he's spending a lot of time crafting whatever he wants us to read next. So. Well, and, and also he may have lost some audience just with uh, starting a story, you know, with one novel and, and, and the, the audience expects the sequel to come out next, but it's yeah. usually um, so, something else. Sure. I mean, Books of the Art, I know there's the, the fabled third installment of Books of the Art yeah. and then, uh, and then of course, Aberat 4 and 5. Uh, yeah, so there but- are... There was Glory supposed to, to be a Cabal two and three, you know, right at the right after the first one. Uh, yeah. that... I I mean I I'm I don't mind if the cha- if vision has changed like the Abra that now is now a quintet. That's that's fine. That's great. Mm-hmm. I suppose it just depends on when he will realize his uh, all the artworks and all the oil and canvases he wants to produce alongside that book. Um, I'm willing to be patient, but I'm not a child, so I'm I'm okay with the idea of it taking another three four years if that's what it takes for him to realize the the story as he wants it out yeah, there. But yeah. This is one of the commercial problems, especially with YA. I mean, I, I, I highlighted in the um, introduction that, you know, alongside Abarat, which is, you know, beautiful and 
a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of writing and a beautiful, beautiful book in terms of its production. Um, you know, that came out in the early 2000s. And then we had the Harry Potter kind of momentum coming alongside. Well, just, be just before that, it was kind of increasing in its momentum. And then soon after that, we had Twilight. And the things that I think are interesting about those two other series is not necessarily that they're better or worse. I think we could have a really interesting debate about that. But rather that they came really quickly, that there was a sequel after sequel within 12 to 18 months so yeah. kids are still kids when the next installment comes out and Abra and Clive's vision obviously just cannot compete with that because the process of creating it is so much longer yes yeah, seven, so, seven years sometimes between yeah uh, yeah right right yeah. And uh, you mentioned Harry Potter, and um, mm -hmm. I, I can't help but make the parallel here with Aberat as well, with the Candy Quackenbush and Harry Potter. And uh, like like you say in your introduction, the Clyde Barker is all about the liberating possibilities of transfiguration. And mm -hmm. um, I think one of the differences between Harry Potter and Candy is that while Potter is a, a kid thrust into this fantasy world, it's almost, it's an institutional place, like Hogwarts is a school. It's almost frozen in this strictly regulated school environment, while Candy is most almost literally washed out to sea in Aberat, and that's how her, her adventure starts. And then she's left completely lost at the whim of this fantasy world where anything can happen, right? She navigates these adventures and makes friends and foes. And for Potter, it's it's um, there's a weight of prophecy, right? It's heavy with sacrifice and darkness. He ultimately becomes singled out and prepares for the confrontation alone or with just his best friends. But for Candy, it's an adventure. Everyone knows her by book two. The wind in Aberat speaks of her adventures and she becomes more powerful and important with each new thing she learns with plenty of friends to help her along the way. And so um, there's this idea of this transcendence, right? These characters always go on this journey of transcendence and they, and, uh, you know, if you compare it, for example, with Cronenberg, uh, when you say that um, Clive Barker is about the rearrangement and transformation of the human body that leads mm -hmm. to transcendence, for example, in Cronenberg, usually it's the other way around. It's, there's a transformation, but it doesn't lead to any sort of transcendence. It just leads into this dark uh, monstrosity. It usually reveals something that you may have suspected about yourself or you come into contact with some forbidden information. I'm thinking of, like I say, video drum, for instance. And uh, yeah. it kind of then manifests on the body as sort of this uh, mark of your for your access to forbidden knowledge or your access to something terrible. It leads to profound understanding, but it's still something I think that you're right. There's a there's a dark, dark quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, with the Harry Potter thing as well, I mean, part of that is to do I think as well with the British institution of, you know, boarding school, there's a certain conservatism there in terms of that literature, um, you know, the idea. Of, yeah, the uniforms, but also the idea of school, school days as something that is uh, particularly special or formative in your identity. And I think that that's something that I find to be uh, quite, quite, quite British in some respects. Uh, and I think that that is um, something that he, absolutely discards from the outset with um with Aberat. you know as you were saying you know she she literally is, is is washed away early on in that first book and from there we are in this this secondary world this constructed secondary world where we discover its magical possibilities and the whole archipelago and all that um right. the idea being that you could you could have 25 books in the Aberat series if you wanted to quite uh -huh. easily just with the islands alone so there is there is this amazing quality for it to extend itself outward because it's a secondary world whereas harry potter's books are all kind of marked as well by the each year that he goes through his secondary school experience it's, so yes the school year yeah yeah, the school year kind of marks the entire kind of um, timeline of the of each instalment. So, I understand the appeal of the Harry Potter books to grow up alongside that because there's something very regimented and structured in that. Whereas mm -hmm. with with Aberat, I think it's much richer in terms of its kind of um, world building exercise, but um, it also means that you can. It opens it up to so many more possibilities in terms of uh, the the account, the, the creatures and the the the, the monsters uh, and the experiences that Candy has in, in you know in the world of the Aberat. So I think that that's um, a very different type of fantasy in the end, and it's something that's much harder 
to create because you don't have those same structures in place that you would have with the Potter books. But even even something like Twilight, which, as I say, is someone who writes spent most of my research on vampires. So Twilight is both a, a source of deep, deep frustration to me. And at the same time, um, uh, one that kind of has kind of helped some of my uh, my research. One of the things I do find with that is it's, it's equally about those kind of moments of um, growing up, those painful moments between being a teenager and being an adult and, and all those kind of experiences into first love and, and whatever else. But what's frustrating about it is that um, the secondary world of it as such, the world of vampires, it's actually really boring and really banal, <laughs> really un, and really uninteresting. You're like, the, the domesticity of monsters in this particular series is very, very dull, whereas you can never accuse Clive of that. You could never right. accuse him of being dull. He's always got some fascinating, fantastic creature for you to examine or explore, or he'll describe it in a very beautiful way. Um, the writing is not of high standard in, in Twilight whatsoever, but in Clive's YA, novels they are the, the descriptions are still as beautiful and the lyrical um as you as you could expect from his adult fiction so uh and so yeah. yeah so anyway i could talk and talk about that but it's just it, i find that that he's he's in this kind of interstitial space between very popular texts and very popular material around the same kind of nine ten years but Aberat suffered um unnecessarily i think because of that um, demand on the reader. It's not giving. It's giving you a story. It's giving you a beautiful world, but it's also a demanding experience. It's not just spoon fed to you. And going right back, and back to what you said about uh, vampires too. Clive's got a lot mm. of a lot of vampire stories, but people wouldn't necessarily recognize them as vampire stories just because his his creatures are so different. That's true. I mean, he's not one I've discovered who is really into the. In, in, in sustaining the template around vampires, he likes to break open templates and and, and, and and morph them into something new and strange. I mean, one of my favorite instances of vampirism in his works is in Thief of Always when Harvey gets transformed mm -hmm. uh, on Halloween and the, the power and the kind of the drunken power he feels when he's a vampire, um, when he's, um, you know, kind of having, having fun in the garden. And I, I find that to be a beautiful kind of a, a very, very short, but very, very powerful sort of little distillation of classic vampirism in, uh, in Clive's work. But his other kind of characters and, mon and monsters, for want of a better word, I think that they're, he always likes to play with it and put his own stamp on it. He doesn't want to just resurrect traditional tropes and types of monsters. Right. I think one of his most subversive vampire stories is uh, Human Remains in the Books of Blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At first, it seems it's just going to be a golem style story, but then it, it's a mixture of golem meets vampire. And there's this um, there's this feeding of of the, the monster from the uh, the the male character. Um, um, I forgot his name, <laughs> yeah, but Gavin, uh, I think or get. Yeah, Gavin. Yeah, okay. so the young gay prostitute. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's a big subversion right there of of the vampire story. But if I can just go back to what you were talking about, Twilight. For me, the most frustrating aspect of Twilight is actually the fact that vampires always have this um, sexual component to it, this mm -hmm. seduction. Um, and in in Twilight, it's very abstinent isn't it it's very yeah. abstinence yeah. there's this i don't know if it's because stephanie myers uh had some mormon uh upbringing but there's this this almost uh per pervasive abstinence throughout the entire story oh I and, totally yeah yeah and once they do have sex it's to procreate to have a baby so mm -hmm. um it, it's very strange that for most of the book, the attraction between the two of them is just because he thinks she smells so good, he wants to eat her, literally. <laughs> <laughs> or at that's least that's true. what I got, yeah. What, what, she, what does he say to her? You're my brand of heroin or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, terrible kind of pun there. But yeah, I mean, it's... Um, yeah, I, I do argue that it's very much imbued in that culture, that mid-2000s culture um, around abstinence and um, absent-only education. Um, yeah. I interestingly have a book coming out on this next year, not on Twilight, but on vampires in general from 1968 onwards. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if that's of interest, um, do do check that out next year. Oh, cool. um, but it's uh, it, it's something that I find problematic with those books. But they're very much of their time. I don't think those books would have had the same traction now. You know what sure. I mean? It's a, it's very much of their time. And 
I understand there's a, as a potential sweetness to it uh, in relation to its... Uh, this like, this Romeo and Juliet thing going on in, in between those two characters, but sure. ultimately, it is a heteronormative, deeply conservative series of novels, so and films. Um, so I find that as someone who wants to read material by Clive Barker, I don't necessarily want to be reading um, or I won't find much in it for me when it's deeply conservative and heteronormative. I want something that's going to be a little bit more imaginative and exciting and have, uh, you know, a, a, a more powerful uh, acknowledgement of queer culture as well. So, right. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the first part of, of uh, Dark Imaginer, uh, we open up with Daryl Jones's essays called Visions of Another Albion. And this yeah. actually taught me a lot about the Thatcher years, because I grew up during the Thatcher era um, in Portugal. That's the yeah. 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 Uh, so I do remember, you know, um, you know, the miners uh, on TV and complaining mm -hmm. and, and, and Margaret Thatcher, which most people don't know this. It's funny because they call her the Iron Lady, but yeah. she actually trained with a speech therapist to lower her voice a couple of octaves so she would sound more authoritative more male yeah it shows you the misogyny of that kind of leadership as well insofar as she couldn't have be seen to have a shrill voice yeah right yeah That's so true. that was that was this um this this era of of uh privatizing everything and you know just pull yourself by your bootstraps and uh, and all that and so there was a lot of of uh of political tension at the time and uh i learned a lot about this first essay because i had never thought to include that because it was not part of my cultural reference because I, I knew about Margaret Thatcher, of course, but a lot of people, for example, in America probably won't know a lot of the stuff that's mentioned in this essay. Yeah. And I think that really helps you localize yourself a little bit more in Clive's shoes during that time in London um, while he was you know, having his creative output and how that might have affected um, – some of the the stories and themes that he used in his in his fiction. So I thought this was very very interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a very important essay. And so far as I mean, um, Daryl's work on this is, is is exceptional. He's so interested in the idea of that as you have this political decay going on in the UK in relation mm. to you know, privatization, fragmenting the the working left and the and the hard right at the time uh, under the Tory government. You have. Um, periods and places places particularly in in England that have been left to to decay and rot and you certainly find that also in books of blood with uh the forbidden i mean the architecture and the kind of the, the decrepitude that's ex that's described in that really kind of shines through as well so he talks about he's he does a brilliant job in talking about that idea of um high rise spaces the horrors of those spaces and then what Clive's kind of tapping into in relation to the cultural tension that Right. as you rightly say, might not have been, okay, uh, uh, be, um, readers in the States or, or beyond the UK even mightn't have been aware of, but also the fact that his work, Barker's work, is politically inflected. It just mm -hmm. mightn't always read that way. But this right. is something that I would agree that it's very much a political inflection of, of, of the horrors of 1980s Britain. I think Domination Game does that as well, and very, very explicitly. You definitely see that the horrors of... Uh, of privatization and addiction coming through in the damnation game. Right. There's a lot of, of, uh, realism. It's a more realistic, um, mm -hmm. novel that, uh, mm -hmm. in other instances, like in magic, it became a lot more, you know, into the fantasy world and, and not so much into the dynamic of, of the social dynamic of the characters and how they interact, but more into like the fantasy world. Let's create a whole new universe and populate mm -hmm. it and show it to people. But in the damnation game, it's, it's a hard book to get through sometimes because it's just so, uh, you know, you have Karis and she's going through a draw and she's, you know, she's addicted to, to heroin and it's kind of a hard thing to, to read sometimes. Um, so for example, yeah. yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was I was just going to say that uh, this this first uh, essay really really taught me a lot. And um, so that this post the breaking of uh, the post war consensus in Britain in the 70s, for example, this this idea that uh, um, there were these little groups of art or um, artists and politicians and trying to take the society in different directions and trying to create something that would break away from this conservatism and this repressed. Um, uh, society. 
I mean, yes. the body politic, the, the short story, kind of alludes a little bit to this break of the consensus, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. But then the idea of when you bring it back together again, what are you bringing back with it? I mean, um, what are the kind of the horrors that can be consolidated together again when you... <laughs> when you literally remake the body politic. I think right. it's I think it's that feeling that you get with neoliberalism in the 1980s of there is a the beginning of a despair that works its way through the fiction. And I think that's why a lot of it gets uh, articulated out as a form of either frustration or violence because people mm -hmm. feel there's no future if everything's been privatized. Right. So, um, and then when you bring that back together, then, well, what's the outcome of this? Are we, is it a collective recognition of the future is going to be really bleak? Or is it a, is the only answer to all this privatization to collectively come together in a violent manner uh, in order right. to, to stand up against the oppressive uh, political regimes in place? Um I, I, I think, yeah, I think I think I think um, Daryl really kind of hits the nail on the head in terms of his analysis of this material, because he looks at this political uh, frustration as something that really informed a lot of 1980s fiction. So mm -hmm. it certainly is is completely in tune with uh, with with other material that coming out of that time. Uh, and again, I, I know he would be thinking of um, other, other kind of 1960s and 70s writers like Dennis Wheatley and people like that. But uh, I know that um, with Barker's short stories in particular, he thinks that he, he thinks that Barker's at his most visceral and possibly his most brilliant in the books of blood. So uh, I'm, I'm sure Daryl will be really pleased that you really enjoyed the, the uh, essay as much as he did. Yeah. Um, hey, like you said in your first introduction, we have such insights to show you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't resist the pun. I, I went in at the end, just couldn't resist it. I was like, well, you know. <laughs> I wonder what the, uh, I wonder what the uh, uh, economic anxiety climate of of the the tweens that we're as we're going through is going to influence fiction like twenty years from now. I wonder how that's going to influence that, um, because we're going through this time now where it seems like. There's a lot of xenophobia around the world right now. There's a lot of uh, uh, reactionary uh, response to to changing society. Like you said, when the body politic is destroyed and then rebuilt, what's going to mm -hmm. come along with it? You know, sometimes it could bring uh, uh, reform, it could bring progress, but it could also bring fascism. And so yeah. you never know what's going to happen. It depends on what if the right things fall in the right place or if if someone takes advantage of this uh, period of reconstruction reform to change uh, society in a way that's going to put it on a different course. Um, yeah, that's, that can be complicated. Yeah. It feels like there's a, um, it feels like the, with the, the internet and, and everybody coming together, like here we are in three different time zones chatting about Clive Barker, but it feels like people's uh, ideas of nationalism and, and uh, you know boundaries are being threatened, and and I you know I kind of wonder if that's that's what we're seeing with all the xenophobia and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, we're seeing it over here in the UK as well. I mean, I'm sure you guys realize that in relation to uh, to articulations around Brexit and the EU, and um, but a lot of this stuff is is bound up in ideas of people being feeling like they've been neglected. Um, I'm I'm. Well, I find a lot of the rhetoric quite quite disturbing. I do think that one of the interesting things about this is that it's targeting and recognizing a group of people who have felt like they've been left behind mm -hmm. and then completely invigorating those people by saying, I recognize what's going wrong with you and I'm going to help or I'm going to make sure that you get your jobs back or I'm going to whatever, reopen particular plants that were closed. And that kind of articulation gives people who have been completely ignored for maybe a generation or two, it gives them hope. But the cost of that is often that to say, it, we didn't take your jobs, we didn't starve you out, it's those people from somewhere else have done that. Um, right. So it's hazing the blame, and it's I know that's a simplification of it, but it is something that I find again and again, it's that same rhetoric of populism, you know, and one actual fact is, is that um, a lot of the issues come down to uh, globalization, uh, neoliberalism, privatization. I mean, I'm uh, the, the current administration in the United States is all about that. So it's, um, it, it's, it's completely disingenuous to say that, you know, you're going to help people who have been on the poverty line for two, two or three generations um, without kind of scapegoating someone who doesn't deserve 
deserve to be scapegoated. So it's been very distressing to read. But it's also, it's interesting, it's not just necessarily on the basis of race or nationality, but also, again, we're getting a backlash in relation to other issues around queer identity and transgender politics. It's very interesting, but a very, very bleak time. So the fiction yeah. will be amazing in about 10 years to analyse it. <laughs> we <laughs> hope so. Yeah, uh, we get a bit of critical distance, we'll be good, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, politicians in the 80s and 90s used to tell us that, hey, we're going to build a great society, we're going to build, you know, the future is is going to be uh, a utopia. And then mm -hmm. it didn't happen, and now they're, they just decided, well, what works? And then what works is saying, well, we can't create that new society that's going to be utopia, but we can protect you from the forces that are trying to destroy a way of life. And so, of course, that involves having someone to point to and saying, we're protecting you from them. You know, they're coming, you know, they're going to invade us or whatever. And, you know, we will yeah. protect you. And now, and I think that's really dangerous because you shouldn't look at the people who run the country. You shouldn't look at them as, you know, a paternal figure, because I think that puts you on a slippery slope. You should see him as someone who can help manage constructing your future, not like someone who's going to treat you like an underling or like a, a son or, or a, a child or whatever, child. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. And again, I, I noticed just with the recent elections you guys had over there, um, you know, in spaces that actually are next to borders, significant borders, um, the, the, the vote did not spike in relation to racism it was actually going the other way people recognize that this is um hyperbole this isn't reality this is hyperbole and racist rhetoric whereas right. the further you are away from those borders mm. the more inclined those people were to vote for uh protectionist strategies so right. it shows you that there's places where actually, and the same thing is true over here in relation to the voting passions around uh around brexit places that might be up uh, it might be high unemployment but they don't necessarily have a lot of immigration issues, were places that voted very, very much to leave, whereas mm -hmm. places of mass immigration space, you know, um, London, Manchester, places like that, where you have a lot of uh, multiculturalism, voted to remain because right. they could see the benefit of all that. So it shows you that sometimes you're, if you're told to be scared of the boogeyman, but you don't understand the boogeyman, you're going to be more frightened than someone who actually has experienced an understanding of living in spaces that are open to all kinds of people. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's depressing, but it's, it's, it, it falls in line with a lot of historical examples as well. So, And we yeah. were going uh, in a different direction here with, uh, you know, under the previous administration, you know, there was, you know, legalizing gay marriage, you know, protecting yes. LGBT people, having making sure that LGBT people could go to the uh, could join the army and not be discriminated against. And now all of a sudden we have this new administration that's trying to erase the LGBTQ people out of institutions. They're trying to, you know, they're pointing to other people saying, oh, they're they're invading us or they're infesting our borders. And the also the progress on the front of of, uh, you know, women's rights and and, uh, and yeah. uh, you know, the role of women in society and um, which can be it's a good segue to talk a little bit about Jacqueline S. Uh, that's <laughs> also mentioned yeah. here in the essay. Um, so mm -hmm. Jacqueline S., she ends up turning a man into a woman in the story. And mm -hmm. I see that kind of a reflection of the inability of man to experience what it means to be a woman and the frustration yes. that she acts upon, uh, yeah. because ultimately, you can you can be a man and you can try to understand women and you can read all about it and you can be a, a real staunch feminist, but you won't have the experience, the life ex experience of being a woman. So you'll never know what it's like to have someone tell you to shut up just because you're in a group of men or you won't know mm -hmm. what it's like to be going home and have someone someone's footsteps following you and you mm -hmm. get scared because you think you might be sexually assaulted. And for men, sometimes we tend to not think about those things because we don't experience them. So mm -hmm. when women complain about that, we think, well, that never happened to me. And of course, it never happened to you because you're not a woman. So, um, yeah, there's this yeah, there's this idea that we have to be more understanding of other people's experiences. And I think Jacqueline S. Um, is a reflection of that in certain ways. Yeah, I think I think it's a way as well of kind of 
re-articulating the impl implicit violence that comes at the kind of the margins of um, identity or identifying as a woman. I mean, I think that there's an issue around, yeah, as you say, the kind of fear of whether it's uh, being told to to shut up by patriarchy or indeed if it's something more kind of biologically um, violent in relation to, to, you know, sort of sexual assault, etc. Uh, right. I think there's there's something very interesting about the way that uh, that it's turned around to, so you can't have the, Im the, 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 the embodied experience, but rather you can share that experience through the disabling or the dismemberment of a, uh, a male body or a male psyche. So so it's quite mm -hmm. it's quite interesting in that respect. Um, I was going to say that, that Clive Clive is one of the few horror authors I found even since the eighties who actually writes strong women in a very interesting way. Um, mm -hmm. I've always found his his female characters to be to be really uh, engaging and and fully fleshed out and uh, and are not just there as girlfriends and wives and shrews and uh, people to be rescued. They have agency and they are um, they are very uh, emotionally complex. And I think that that's what makes his female character something that's really not are um, explored enough. Uh, that how interesting his female characters are. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, Kirsty is not just the final girl. She's also the person who defeats the Cenobites. She's not just the remaining survivor of a traumatic event, but she actually ends the event. She she kills the monster. She banishes them out of uh, the movie. So yeah. in that in that regard, she is fighting back. So, uh, but equally, and, so Julia Julia is a fantastic character, not just oh, yeah. as a, an antihero, but you know Julia herself. She's the one who's got the the guts to quite literally go through with these uh, terrible crimes. She knows what she's after, and she's willing to go through it, violence and and and, and hell be damned, in order to bring uh, Frank back. So um, we, we we certainly have that kind of um, a desire to be to, the desire for power and the desire for um, agency and control. Immaculata from um, Weave World is another fantastic example of that. So um, he writes villains, uh, or his female villains, his villainesses, he writes them with as much complexity as his heroes. And I think his females, as I say, are not just discarded for male subjectivity. Right. So that's, that's uh -huh. really empowering. That's really, really exciting. I thought it was interesting, the parallel that uh, I think it's Daryl. He does uh, between Immaculata and Margaret Thatcher again. So oh, I this, that was... this is Tim Wallington's um, essay. There you go. Yeah. 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 So I thought that it's was interesting. I, I always mm -hmm. saw her more as like this kind of Vestal Virgin, um, mm -hmm. almost this Vestal Virgin, which is kind of like similar archetypes, I guess. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. but Kirsty is very empowered throughout the story, uh, in the book and in the movie, more so in the book, maybe in the novella, because in the novella, she's kind of like this mopey, you know, um, part of a love triangle. And, um, yeah. and at the end she does take agency and, and, uh, becomes the guardian of, of this sacred object. And, um, uh, in the end, in the fight with the engineer in Hellraiser, Stephen, tr her boyfriend, tries to take the box away from her, <laughs> and and then she yeah. just kind of hits him and takes the box back, and she yeah. banishes the engineer. So that small things there, you may not notice that, but that is a, a great act of empowerment. Uh, Helen be becomes the Candyman and and slays Trevor for his betrayal. Um, mm -hmm. Or in right, Magica. So. Don't we all really enjoy that? I always really enjoy that bit where she finally you just. You know, Trevor gets what for, you know? So it's, it's yeah. just desserts, yeah. The or the Magica with The thing with that Judith. Bugs, bugs me about that, though, is that it seems a little forced the way he says her name five times in the mirror. That, yeah. That always, <laughs> to me, it's always like, it seems like they're pushing it a little bit. I see. Uh, uh, the complexity of having to make sequels. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lay the breadcrumbs somewhere, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in Magica with Judith, she's she's basically a nexus for the whole story. It starts because of um, her a relationship with the uh, with the um, oh, I forgot his name. Godolphin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oscar. Yeah. Oscar. Yeah. yeah. It starts because of that because he hires uh, Pi to kill her. And mm -hmm. then it sets off the whole story in motion. And then everything was kind of flipped around Judith a little bit, uh, in, 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 if you look at it that way, because not only was she um, important uh, for, for Gentle, um, you know, she, 
yeah, basically she's she's one of the nexus of the whole story. And uh, women, like you said, they're um, – or Dorothea in Lord of Illusions in the movie more so than the story. Um, yes. I always thought that or the Lord of Illusions – Susanna in, um, Susanna in Weave World. You know, um, again, Susanna – I know by – I suppose towards the end of it we do sort of feel Susanna's battle is slightly – um, diminished in comparison with Cal's, but you know, at the same time, we have these incredible sort of uh, strong characters who come through to fight and channel powerful otherworldly sources uh, of influence. Whether it's you know from uh, Immaculata's perspective of trying to kind of gain power over the over the uh, seer kind, or indeed if it's something more um, traditional like uh, everyday kind of relationships like Susanna and Cal have as, as friends. But I think there's something very powerful. He just he writes women in a way that is in no way dim dim it no way diminishes their power and their agency, right. and that's rare. That's rare. So uh, yeah. he needs to be given kudos for that. I think. Yeah, it, it, and, it is uh, really interesting the way that uh, Susanna and Cal, you you know, just as a trope, you expect them to become romantically involved. And, sure. Th and the way that doesn't happen and that they, they decide that it's better to be friends is is really interesting. And, and, and it means that, that Susanna is not just there as a, as a foil. Yes, exactly. She's not just there as the eventual reward for the for the journey, um, but she has her own journey as well. And the fact, again, it goes back to her grandmother having the uh, the custody of the carpet in the first place. So, yeah. again, women are written into Barker's world mm -hmm. in a very uh, completionist sense. They're not written in as foils or lovers or or cons consolation prizes. You know, so it's um it's good because, as I say, in, in in Gothic, women can be diminished into, into, into while well, they can be quite strong, they can be diminished as hysterical c characters or hysterical creatures who uncover something awful. Uh, and in horror, they can often be the victims of violence and then discarded. Um, but as I say, his complexity actually gives women a lot more, um, a lot more to do. And uh, one of the things that uh, one of the themes that I always identified in Clive Barker stories, um, for example, in uh, Julia and Frank. Or yes. uh, Dorothea and Nix, to some extent, not too much, but is the death in the maiden and the sense that um, you see a monster and there's a woman there and there's some sort of tension between them and she's not particularly afraid of the monster. So there's this duality between death and the maiden and um, that kind of tension between her and the monster, which there's an essay here that explores some of that um, – attractiveness that some women might feel for Clive Barker's fiction in the sense that the monster is very seductive. Ah, yes. Bridget Cherry's, um, Bridget Cherry's essay on this is, is absolutely brilliant. I think, well, there's a couple of interesting things there because Bridget, Bridget works a lot on audience studies. And um, one of the interesting things that she found is that there is a sort of sexual power that is gained from uh, wanting to explore uh, different representations of monstrosity on screen. We often think that women might necessarily be frightened or be uh, um, terrified in the face of monstrosity and horror, but actually that's not the case at all. Um, so uh, Brid Bridget's own uh, look at the audiences of uh, Clive's films and Clive's literature actually they tend to actually awaken very kind of um, sometimes very overtly sexual responses. Um, there's something profo profound and beautiful and perverse in the best meanings of the word in his creations. And a lot of women really, really take to that. I'm reminded just in my mind of um, Doug Bradley when he was interviewed about um, shooting Hellbound. I think somebody asked him, could, could they borrow the outfit? For him and his girlfriend, <laughs> so, you know, it has a particular sort of uh, resonance. Um, I'm, I'm sure if you ask Doug, he'll tell you. But I remember that he was interviewed and he was told about that. I, he said that someone wanted to borrow the outfit, which is kind of tells you a lot about, you know, all sorts of different types of uh, fantasies pervade around Clive's monsters as well. Right. And uh, in Article 2, uh, Marks of Weakness, Marks of Woe uh, by oh, Kevin Korsterfin. Yeah, um, I, I particularly enjoy the, uh, the introduction of Bl uh, Blake and Varley uh, and how they were uh, producing these uh, kind of seances or trying to communicate otherworldly spirits. And then ultimately Blake painted the ghost of a flea, which is a very striking, very um, – I'm a big fan of William Blake, and I know Clyde Barker is also a big fan of Blake. And uh, yeah. uh, in certain ways, uh, Aberat is kind of a Blakean uh, – 
work of art um, in the sense that it's both words and, and visuals come together. Um, so in that sense, I think it's very Blakian. But um, The Ghost of a Flea, I could just think immediately of Frank because Frank mm -hmm. is one of these bloodthirsty men that uh, needs to be put away. Otherwise, he will just suck the blood out of, you know, who knows how many people. This is true. He is. I mean, he is vampiric. Exactly. I mean, from that point of view of just regeneration and, and, and whoever you need to kill in order to to realize your goal. I mean, the ghost of the flea image, I think, is there's something quite I can see a lot of kind of what Clive would draw from that in relation to it's it's got this beautiful craft to it. It's got these beautiful colors uh, in the book. It is reprinted in black and white, but it is something that um, I think there's a certain power to it and an, an awe, a fixation. Uh, and it also is one of those paintings that has this really interesting kind of afterlife in popular culture. So um, it's, a, it's a lovely kind of stepping off point for, for Kevin. Um, I also, you know, I know that um, Blake himself is a polymath, so there are these connections between himself and Barker insofar as they didn't just have one dominant mode of ex artistic expression right right in Clyde Barker's fiction if I can just go off and something that I've sure. learned or were rem or was reminded of in this book was that in Clyde Barker's fiction the weird the transformative you know the monsters are there not just to scare and hurt us they're they're there to not just take from us but they're there so we can face our fears and come out of the other side so if we change then we become more wise and sometimes Clive Barker's monsters want company. They want a friend to offset their loneliness, you know. Um, and this is how we grow up. We face the unorthodox. We face the queer and monstrous side inside of us. It makes us stronger, more complete. Um, you know, being scared is a cathartic process, right? It delivers us into – in Clive Barker's fiction, I think this delivers us into ultimately having a new vision of the world. We can either embrace parts of us that we repress due to societal norms and we – or. Or we can come to terms with the somewhat benevolent, uh, benevolent aspect of being an outsider in the sense that we, we can reach out and go to other places that other people never do. And once we're there, we can learn from it. We can face our fears and come out with a deeper understanding of ourselves. Um, a bit like Julia and her journey from being a suburban wife to an empowered, focused woman, embracing her desires as a part of who she is. Um, so we may see her as evil, but that's just her shedding masks and societal norms and following her own direction and becoming who she really wants to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. The devil gives I us totally normality. <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah. does. Um, I mean, Mamoulian from Damnation Game does exactly the same thing. I mean, because we're terrified of this this otherworldly ethereal figure for so much of that novel. And I mean, he does commit really atrocious things at times. He does commit pretty awful acts of sadistic violence and certainly gets Breer to do so, which I think he's a fantastic character. Um, this acolyte who is uh, is dead but doesn't know it in um, in Damnation Game. So he starts to sort of rot and fall apart yeah. as this mm -hmm. goes on and douses himself in, ash, in aftershave just to kind of cover the smell. Um, this is quite visceral and quite gross. But um, Mamoulian himself is so sort of ethereal and closed off. And when we discover finally why he's chasing after Whitehead, you know, that discovery of I just want someone to go with me into the afterlife, you're kind of like, wow, what a human response to yeah, a very, right. to, a, to a really <clears throat> horrific, uh, fantastical uh, Faustian bargain of a story. Actually, it's all about facing down death and actually not wanting to do it alone. And I think there's something incredibly poignant about that. So, and, uh, yeah. and and that came back again in in Lord of Illusions, even to the sure. point to the point where both these characters are called the Puritan. Mm hmm. Exactly. So yeah. we, I mean, we get this idea at Lord of Illusions that, you know, again, being bound up in someone else's fate, if you're going to face into, you know, whether it's transformation or you're going to face your own undoing or your own death. I think there's something he's always, he's always interested in kind of bringing two separate parts back together or into a whole of some sort. And I think that's very much at work in Lord of Illusions. Yeah, there's a article four, the joyless magic of Lord of Illusions, is a, uh -huh. an essay by Harvey yeah. O'Brien. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting approach to uh, why this might have been Clive Barker's last movie, um, yes. and yeah. and the, the the meta side of Clive Barker making Lord of Illusions as a way to um, 
tell us a little bit about LA and the movie industry and and, uh, and stuff like that. I, I was particularly stricken by this quote from magician Darren Brown in the essay. He says that magic yes. isn't about fakes and switches and dropping coins in your lap. It's about entering into a relationship with a person whereby you can lead him economically and deftly to experience an event as magical. And I think this is the same thing with cinema. A director does the same thing with a movie. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, it's uh, if it's fair, if it's played fair, and I think I think that's. I mean, I think if if we if we feel that we've been had or we've been done uh, over, you know, if we feel that we've been exploited for a cheap trick, I think that actually leaves quite a sour taste. Whereas entering into something illusory, fantastical, potentially transformative, is a very powerful experience uh and i mean darren brown i don't know if you know his work but he is an extraordinary um uh, performer and he's someone who very much uh undoes the mystique of magic but all all while he's tricking you into noticing something or disappear making something uh disappear in front of you or whatever it might be he's a very he's a he's brilliant because he's actually able to kind of show you how all the magic works but at the same time still dazzle you um and i think that that's something that in lord of illusions i think what harvey's trying to to, to what harvey really kind of articulates is that he's you can see that there's a particular love lost with the process of filmmaking as opposed to the story that's being told. I think Clive loves the story. I think the problem is, is that studios just, the, the frustration of making a film by committee uh, is evident yeah. in parts of that film. And I think that for someone who's used to working under his own conditions, whether it's painting or writing, he can do it anytime he wants. He can produce what he likes. He can release to us as an audience whatever he wants. That's a very powerful position to be in, whereas working in a studio environment, you are really beholden to your producers, to the heads of the studio, to the studio's unions, their various unions for production. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, you just can't break those laws. So, uh, and you're also using somebody else's money. So it's a very different and very constraining thing. And I can understand why he only produced three, uh, three films in the end, because only one of them truly seemed to be a very happy experience in terms of production. And that was Hellraiser. And, and I thought was... that this particular chapter was really interesting because it was... Um... Because Lord of Illusions, then you can think about well, the movie maker Clive Barker is is a Lord of Illusions, right? Making making yes. movies is making illusions, and then and then in the in the the in the film, the uh, the the Lord of Illusions character Swan gets kind of obliterated by the end. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, yeah. because you know, he, I suppose there. I think yes, I think that you could read it though as a way of saying that. Well, it might not be necessarily at the time a conscious decision on Clive's part that he wasn't going to make any more. But I think by then you get such a frustration with the whole experience that you go, yeah. well, okay, I need to, uh, ne yeah. I need to bring this to a, a conclusion in terms of um, the, 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 the great epic battle at the end. And again, I don't know how recently if you've seen that film, but I remember watching it a couple of years ago when we were, when we were putting this stuff together. And I remember thinking to myself, so many great parts of that film work, but there are moments where you just go, I can see where budget might have run out or I can see where, you know, um, editorial decisions were made just right. to bring it along rather than necessarily develop the story the way Clive might have wanted it to be in the end. Especially yeah. when you compare the director's cut to the theatrical cut that came out. There were lots of 13 or 11 minutes, I think, that they wanted him to cut from yeah. the movie. Um, that ultimately make it an inferior version. Um, it's only after it came out on laser that people could see the entire movie. I was shocked actually when I was rewatching it because I had seen it years ago on videotape. That's how long ago it had been since I'd seen it the first time. And then when I was doing this project, I said, well, obviously going to go out and buy, buy Lord of Illusions on DVD. And when I did, I didn't realize it, but the UK version is the director's cut. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I have not seen the theatrical cut and God, 20 odd years right. I mean yeah. Yeah, so the, the, I actually didn't realize that there was stuff missing until I went back and did some more research and realized that they had shortened you know particular sequences uh and that they had made them less graphic or whatever and I was like it's not even that graphic to begin with I was quite surprised at the the theatrical 
version reading about what the omissions were because as I said I ha- I didn't remember experiencing those differences firsthand it was too long a period in between viewings so uh strange so I have a question about Nix um of course his name means nothing um so he's ultimately uh he brings the wisdom of the grave right so he he's not a cult leader that's going to lead them into paradise he's going to lead them into um death yeah. and oblivion um <laughs> Is it is it fair to say? I know there were a few Deleuzian uh, references in these essays. Do you think it's accurate to say that Nix um, might represent almost a body without organs, but a cancerous body without organs? Oh, interesting. That's a really interesting observation. Um, I, I must admit, um, Deleuze is not. I'm not a particular fan of Deleuze myself. I must admit, and I'm sorry if that breaks any hearts. But um, I think that it's. I think that. Harvey's observation around around that kind of Deleuzian rhizomatic exploration of you know going out into the nothingness and and, and exploding outward into nothingness. I think that mm-hmm. yeah, you can read that that way. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, do you read him as body with, as having sort of a nihilistic body without organs? I think so because he's caught in this series of uh, loops. Like all he wants to do is go into the darkness with Swan, and that's pretty much the the, the loop that kind of defines him a bit. And um, it's pretty self destructive. So I was just wondering about that. No, I think I think that's a really interesting observation. It's uh, I haven't on I haven't honestly thought about it in that level, but that's that's what kind of that's what's great about this. We can really, we can. <laughs> We can have much, much more in-depth conversations about this kind of yeah. idea. I mean, there is definitely this negative or negated sense of self that, and 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 the the Barkarian twist of if I'm going into the abyss, you're coming with me. So <laughs> right, yeah. So this know, kind of I, yeah, like death needs a companion uh, in oh, a yeah. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I always kind of saw it as this dichotomy between wanting to believe in in this you know go, going into this magical uh, world of the afterlife and then the villain is this this doubt that maybe when i die there's just nothing you know maybe I, when i die i'm just gone and that's it and it's just darkness and and yeah. he turns that into a villain both i think in in the damnation game and in in lord of illusions I think that's the most awful thing about i mean the awful in the in a wonderful sense but like the most terrifying thing about the idea of dying is not that you will go somewhere, but that rather there's just nothingness behind it. And mm-hmm. and with Damnation Game, the idea of even when uh, Mamoulian is chopped up into tiny little tiny pieces, you still get this this concept of consciousness. And as it drifts away, it's drifting off into into nothingness. And that's that's terrifying. That's far more bleak than anything I can imagine in relation to um, you know other kinds of modes of horror because. It's just saying that we are we are worm food, you know. That's, yeah. yeah, and and yeah. in the, the case of Damnation Game, uh, yeah. to me the most horrible thing about the ending is that Mamoulian just won't die, and uh, even after he's cut into a million pieces, mm-hmm. those pieces still have this instinctual life to them. They still move yeah. even though they're dead and rotting, but they, yeah. they they just keep going. It doesn't stop, and he's still it's there. And it's isn't it? Yeah. It's the idea that consciousness can consciousness can pervade even yeah even the flesh itself but the con that consciousness is still trapped or somehow right. uh stuck and that that again is something that when all of our narratives around death and all of our kind of popular cultural constructs around death we go somewhere and we go there usually with our mind because our body has failed us but the idea that your mind is stuck and your body has failed you spectacularly but you're going nowhere you're either stuck in this awful liminality or you're you're forced to endure but you can't participate in it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, as I say, it's bleak. <laughs> really yeah, bleak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, in part three, we have uh, Clyde Barker's Queer Monsters, Exploring Transgression, Sexuality, and the Other. And this is from Mark Adams, and I believe he used to be the webmaster at the Hellbound Web at one point. Uh, I think he I still is. Ah, yeah. Good man. yeah, lovely. Yeah, um, so... He does mention, uh, um, you know, he focuses a lot on Hellraiser and Frank as a queer character. And um, I always saw Frank more as a representation of toxic masculinity in certain ways. Mm -hmm. I think Uh, it would depend on, I think it would depend on are you looking at Frank from the point of view of the way he treats women, which is obviously horrific and quite disposable. Um, But at the same time, then... 
I think women are not necessarily his just just about a ha, having a, a, a sexual preference for women. I think women are just a means to an end. This is mm-hmm. someone who is sort of uh, like chasing the dragon. He's chasing his orgasm down a particular you know series of uh, of experiences, and so the idea that it ends up being something that's uh, experienced on his own when he actually comes mm-hmm. comes up against the Cenobites, the idea being that, you know, he's skinned and tortured and all that, it's all about the pursuit of that sexual fleshy experience, women be damned. So right. I think that that's where we kind of get this confrontational idea of sexuality and queerness and empowerment, but you don't necess- it doesn't necessarily matter what gender your sexual partner is. It's more to do with the idea that you are looking at sex as something defined. An experience. An experience that, you know, is forbidden, whether that's in terms of it's the, the, the possibilities of doing it or indeed the idea of the cultural constructs that prevent you from acting it out. So Hey, it could be worse. He could be into balloons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's queer that too head around. <laughs> yeah not a good yeah. point good point yeah, that and, uh, yeah. uh and he mentions uh decker uh represents science um and i think in in the cabal for example i think that decker represents kind of this deadly nihilism kind of, kind of this pathological lack of feeling i mean decker just kills he, he doesn't kill because he enjoys it i don't get that vibe out of decker it's a compulsion that makes him want to change the world and the people around him to this sterile dead silence and um barker's monsters usually are cut off from the world in many ways so they're either undead or they're slaves to this darkness and and of course like pinhead they're so exquisitely empty right Mm, I mean, yeah, I certainly with Deckard, the one thing I always feel with Deckard is that he is, and I mean, I'm thinking actually, I don't know why Nightbreed is really coming into my mind on this one in particular. It seems like such a prescient film for today when we were talking about politics earlier. Mm -hmm. The idea that, you know, rigid conformity, the idea to remake the world and to tidy it up. And if that means destroying diversity and beauty and monstrosity and queerness, uh, so be it. It's Uh like this idea of that I'm being sanctioned, that that this kind of tidying up of society is being sanctioned and needed. Mm -hmm. I I think Nightbreed really would stand up very well to criticism in relation to today's culture. It, it seems very familiar, very timely in that sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of strikes me that way. I'm just thinking of it in terms of those kind of political inflections. But, um, yeah, Deckard. Um, I mean, certainly, I think in 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 the film, I definitely get the experience, get the idea that Cronenberg's enjoying it very much. Uh, <laughs> too. It, the, he's really enjoying that screen presence and destroying things. Um, and I think obviously it's 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 benefited enormously from the restoration of the footage and and everything. I mean, it certainly oh, yeah. it has made a hell of a lot more sense than what it was the first time around. That so, was fun. Um, it, it was oh, fun well, to to start Occupy Midian with Russell Charrington yeah. and uh, be able to be a part of of uh, of creating that that community online on Facebook and uh, on the website yeah. and all that. So that was a lot of fun to do. And uh, it finally gave Clive some peace of mind because he once mentioned to Mark Miller that every time a fan brought him Nightbreed to sign, that it actually physically hurt him a little bit to sign that movie. Um, and then yeah. after the director's cut came out, he was finally, like, happy. So that's that he was got, a big... He got the restoration that you need at the end. He got the restoration yeah. of making it exactly what he wanted to do and cutting out stuff that he might not have liked the second time around, you know, he... he <laughs> Was able to change things that you really felt that he needed to, and, and and not everybody gets that opportunity. So that's a really really good thing, you know. I wasn't a fan of one of the things that he cut. Um, I'm, I'm in the sense that I, I don't like that he cut that out of the movie. It was the part where it, uh, you know the. Uh, Boone says, go get them, boys, to the berserkers. <laughs> Clive said he wanted to take that out, so he took it out of the director's cut. And I always thought, oh, that was such a cool uh, moment. It worked for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I suppose we can't win them all, but we got so much else. We got yeah. to think of it like that. We also got narrative clarity, which is nice, too. So, you know, uh, yeah. I, I, Again, I've, I just, every time I think of Nightbreed, I just think about the death by a thousand cuts it took to get that film out. And the Literally. I think lack yeah. of understanding of what Clive does and that it's difficult I think especially when you come to his literature his literature works really really well it's beautifully written it's really interesting in terms of its expression but then when you get to cinematic adaptation it's really hard to adapt a Barker story 
I think it's really tough. So, you know, even him doing it himself actually might be even harder because he's got no critical distance from his own work. So right. trying to make that be realized for a general audience by a studio that doesn't understand him at all, it seems, mm-hmm. that's that's got to be one of the most frustrating experiences for a creative person. So um, I think we're lucky yeah. we have it. <laughs> I think one of the most interesting adaptations of his work was from the the Forbidden story, um, because yeah. Bernard Rose actually expanded on the story, and he expanded it in a way that uh, seems to please a lot of a lot of fans. In the sense that, of course, in the the short story, Candyman is never really fully crystallized or described, um, yeah. and he's not the ghost of someone who actually existed, like in the movies. Uh, he's just this this character that's created out of sheer belief. Um, <laughs> he's he's a, a urban legend come to life. And so in the sense that Bernard Rose decided to put Tony Todd in it, and then he expanded it on the second one and gave him an entire backstory. Um, for some people, I, I, I have yet to know a fan of Clyde Barker who didn't like that expansion <laughs> of the mythos, uh, even though it kind of strays a little bit from the original story. But there we go. Sometimes people add things to a story and it, it makes it a little better. I don't know. It's or different. It, so yeah i totally agree i mean i i i really love the burn and rose film i must admit and i i see it as one of those really excellent examples of when clive's work can be adapted and can be made uh, it enables people to discover it i suppose on its own terms um it, it, it's such a good idea it was such a good idea as well to to transfer it to chicago to make it uh, completely mm-hmm. um, ex- um, accessible to an American audience, and then right. bringing in, of course, those um, the the, um, the the racial elements to it as well. I thought that was a really inspired choice um, right. because of reading the Forbidden. So much of that short story is about suggestion and about imperfect symmetry and terror and cultural and class issues. In relation to the states, it kind of brings back to racial and historical problems. On episode 100, I had a chance to send Clive, uh, me, Ryan, and Rob, we had a chance to send Clive some questions. One of them was I uh, asked him about his Irish paternal grandmother, Florence, and the tales that she would tell Clive and Roy um, that involved colorful characters like Liverpool's spring heel Jack, uh, was supposed to be this guy who had, like, springs on his shoes, and he would jump out of buildings and kill people and jump back out. Um <laughs> and so I asked him what role his grandmother's stories played in shaping his early love for the fantastic. And his answer was, uh, very much so. Keep in mind that my grandmother first told me the story that would eventually become The Forbidden and then Candyman. She was a very dry storyteller, my grandmother. She told stories with the same tone in which most read a grocery list. There was no emotion when she told stories, no sweeping hand movements, no grandeur. But I learned from her that words, regardless of the way in which they are spoken, have a remarkable amount of impact. So that that was uh, really interesting to be able to ask him that question about um, about uh, his grandmother. And I found out that you know she did tell him a story that eventually became the Forbidden. So that was that was fantastic. That's really cool. I mean, I love the fact that um, um and I think I've mentioned in there, but uh, I I love the fact that she told him about you know little boys going into public toilets and things like that, and that kind of image, you know, that they could be castrated in public toilets. This kind of terror right. of being of being uh, attacked in 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 um public restrooms and i thought that that was a fantastic kind of way for it to be worked into uh into Brenner rose's film yeah it's yeah. really it's really terrifying the first it time is. you see it yeah. candy is a great film to see when you're a teenager because it's just that little bit more dangerous than your conventional slasher or your conventional kind of horror film because it's quite visceral in some places so i thought that was a really interesting biographical element that they kept in the film and, right. and for Clive Barker fans, I mean, I think just it was really it, 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 like I had just read this finished reading the short story before I went to see Candyman in the movie theater and to see uh, to see all these lines from the short story put in in this hypnotic voice, you know, and and uh, and Helen's kind of getting knocked over by the power of of these lines that are lifted right out of the short story. It was like, wow, this is set. You know, you, you don't mind all the differences because. It it's so um, it's it it uh, because it pays homage to the to Clive's oh, writing yeah. so much. 
It's very respectful. I, yeah. I think, I mean, and, and yet it has a completely different life to it, which makes it such a reward when you read the short story or when you watch the film. You can see them as two different things, but they're both very respectful of each other. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it works quite nicely. Yeah. And then you have essay number eight, which is called Breaking Through the Canvas, Towards a Definition of Metacultural Blackness in the Fantasies of Clive Barker by Tony Vinci. And yeah. um, and since we're talking about Candyman, this this uh, article focuses a lot on Pi from Imagica as well and uh, and how, um, you know, uh, blackness is represented in Clive Barker's work. We also have um, – so, so Pi is untraceable, right? He's a man without history. He's uh, um, an assassin, and nobody knows who he is, and nobody knows how to contact him. And uh, I thought it was interesting that in Galilee – Galilee is a man with a long history, and we hear the story of his family throughout the centuries, and we get to experience the things he goes through and how he becomes enslaved to the Giris. Um, and Pi also becomes, in a sense, enslaved to his his master and lover. Um, so there's this, this um, period where... Um, and I think there. there's a nice little over section there as well. There's a nice kind of contrast between the two. Um, they share this kind of the, the idea of that they feel that they must in some ways morph their identity around the desires of those that validate them. So whether right. it's the idea of the Geary's and the various different lovers that Galilee takes on, or indeed, and, and the Barbarossas as well. Uh, and uh, at the same time, then we have that with Pi's literal ability to morph and transform mm -hmm. as as needed. Uh, so I think there's this interesting shift around identity politics and then uh, the way that we expect desire to be represented, whether it's through race or through uh, sort of expression um, of, of our own identity. So I think there's something really, really, really interesting there between those two characters, just as you mentioned, uh, Galilee. So. I I like this quote in the article. It says, in Barker's work, fantasy becomes a revolutionary mode of cultural and subjective analysis that liberates by revealing the purely empirical to be radically dreamlike. Um, I, I was very stricken by that particular sentence. And the idea that uh, the black character is separated from the dominant white society, then there's this period of instruction. Uh, and in, in Pi's case, it's when he becomes either whore or assassin, I don't care which, and he just becomes this outsider living in a camp for who knows how many years, right? And then um, and then he gets reintegrated with a new status. So he becomes like the guide for Gentle when he goes into the Dominions. He takes them there. He, he is the person who leads them by the hand into discovering who he really is. And, um, and at the end, he gets... Um, he get he ascends to share this new knowledge, right? He becomes this um, gets a new status at the end, which is he gets taken by Hepexamendios and um, ultimately is is the one who again comes over to Gentle at the end and leads them into the circle of the Imagica. So um, yeah. he gets yeah. I, I thought that was uh, a great analysis of of the Pi character in the essay number eight by Vinci. Fantastic. Yeah. Um great fluid a, a, a wonderful example of that sort of fluidity of character and that ability to grow and change and the fact that he's not a conventional character in any way um and that it, it acknowledges obviously uh, i think a a lack of representation um of fantastical black characters and i think that's mm -hmm. really important so um yeah no it's 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 a magic is one that I always find that whenever I start talking about it, my my in some ways I love it, and in other ways my head hurts thinking about a magic. It's just one of those right. sort of dreamscapes that I kind of go, oh man, I think I just need another reread of it. So um, right, I, I it's it wouldn't be one of my my absolute favorite Barkers, I must admit, but it's a fantastic essay by Tony because he really mm -hmm. parses it apart and does some really really amazing analysis with it. That's why I'm I'm. Curious to know what would happen in the sequel to Galilee, because I would love to know where that story sure. goes. Um, there's a lot of also Galilee goes through history, goes through the civil war in America, slavery and all that. So uh, that would be a uh, that's a great opportunity for him to uh, bring some of those things that, uh, you know, uh, black people in America have gone through and suffered through uh, slavery. Uh, yeah. America was one of the last countries to. Um, and slavery. Some would say they're still going on in other places in the world, but uh, yeah. Um, sure. yeah, so fantastic um, thing. I, I was also very stricken by the the analysis of, of Pi's sexuality in the sense that th they talk here about how, um, how he is, a, as a mystiff, um, he can 
there, there's a time when uh, Gentle wants to see him for who he really is instead of projecting his ideas of who he wants him to be. And then he discovers that he, he's not, um, so he's not female or male, he's something in between. So they find this third way um, of, of communing together physically. And uh, it reminded me of, you know, there were, uh, there were theologians over the years trying to argue if angels have sex, right? I mean, <laughs> and, and trying to discover, uh, you know, our, our arguments about whether or not angels had sex or, you know, and, 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 and this is kind of like the answer, this third way, like this, this idea that um, if you let go of your physicality, you would be able to commune in a way that would be different from just being yeah. a binary thinking of it in binary terms. Yeah. I mean, that's so Barkarian anyway, as yeah. you've just described. I mean, the idea of sh shucking off this mortal coil in some shape or form, whatever that might mean or whatever you need to do in order to gain some sort of otherworldly, strange, forbidden experience. I mean, it's the same idea that, you know, whether angels have sex or not is sort of, it, it's not important until you know you can maybe subjectively understand angels or being able to actually what is it what must it be like to understand the flesh of, of that and then the sexual nature of how you would explore that i i think that um it, it's something quite typical of, of of clive's work in that if you want to reach out for something that's completely unknowable there you must take these sort of fantastical steps towards that transformation right yeah and uh so uh Essay number nine talks about the Halloween haunts that Clive did uh, for um, Universal. And uh, if you've listened to our latest last episode, uh, 201, we did talk to uh, Ed Martinez, who was a special effects artist, and he did talk about making a Hell Hellraiser haunt uh, room um, uh, back in the 90s. So that that was fun. Um, we did mention the briefly the Halloween haunts that Clive did. Freaks, Harvest, uh, um, Hell. Um, so this is this is a really detailed uh, article about that whole enterprise that was done back in the 90s. Um, so a very fascinating thing. I didn't know much about these haunts, I, I admit. So it was very, very informative to read this and, and get an idea of what that was and what some of the things that were shown in the the maze of the haunt. So that, that was pretty fascinating. I thought this was really, really cool. It was very exciting to get this essay um, uh, because I think that what Gareth was doing was looking at something that from a certainly UK and Irish perspective, we don't have these installations. We have them now, but we didn't have them back in the 90s mm -hmm. uh, or certainly late 90s. So to actually discover um, way back when, when I was doing the, the conference, um, that these whole installations existed, they were, you know, designed and done in consultation with, you know, auteurs and horror icons like Clive. That's an incredible thing because now you're transforming Clive's imaginative space into a three-dimensional uh, experience that you can go to. That's that's, yeah. that's like the best thing ever. Yeah. So I, I was very excited by that idea, and I have to say I didn't know really anything about it before um, before um, Gar Gareth presented on it. But uh, I thought it was a fascinating way of looking at um, and experiencing the horror of something that largely lives in your imagination when you're reading um, reading literature, I thought that that was amazing to kind of bring it into that three-dimensional world. And I have to say, I'm, I'm particularly envious of anyone who lives anywhere near sort of Universal Studios around Halloween <laughs> because as someone who works on horror, I'm like, I really got to go to some of the theme park stuff because it just sounds so, um, so exciting and so uh, interactive. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to Orlando once and I visited a bunch of those Disney parks. It was quite an experience. It was one of those things as a kid living in Portugal, growing up there at the time. And I was like, oh, man, I wish I could go to Disney World and check all that stuff. And then you go there and it's it, it, even as an adult, it's something that is very magical to be there and experience that. But uh, living in Portugal, I didn't have uh, Halloween in the 80s. So we didn't have we don't celebrate Halloween. That's more of a Germanic kind of thing. It's, it comes from, you know, Walpurgisnacht from like the German uh, folklore and stuff like that. So the, the witches, Sabbath. So we didn't really have that tradition in a, a predominantly Catholic country like Portugal. Um, wow. Usually what ha yeah, what happens is just you go to the cemetery, you you, you attend mass in the cemetery with the, your family and you clean the graves and you think about your, your loved ones who passed on and that's it. We don't. We don't have it nowadays. Of course, as as uh, American culture is very um, 
it's 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 very adept to exporting itself to other countries. So nowadays, sure, yeah, some of my nephews in Portugal do dress up and go trick or treating for Halloween and have Halloween parties. But when I was growing up, we didn't have that. I mean, I knew what Halloween was, but we just didn't do it. So when I when I saw my first Halloween haunt was at Great America in California. And uh, for me, that was quite an experience. Actually, I think the first haunt I ever saw was with Ryan in Las Vegas oh, yeah. when I got <laughs> married. Yeah, uh, well, at my up. marriage. We went to Eli Roth's Goratorium, and uh, I know I mentioned this on episode 201. Uh, that was the first time I went through a haunt, and you go through a room, and there's like a theme, like there's a church room, and there's a monster and a priest, and something jumps out at you, and it's like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I think it was fascinating, this article, because it, it connected a little bit um, that these haunts that Clyde Barker designed were a way for him to see the monsters in real life, but not uh -huh. necessarily in a movie. Because at this point, yeah. Clyde wasn't doing... Um, he had done Lord of Illusions, and so he was kind of... I remember when Clive was... Um, you know, spiky hair, smoking a cigar with his leather jacket, talking about going to Hollywood and making movies. And then I remember also... Years after Lord of Illusions, when Clive was trying to make other movies like Tortured Souls and all that, nothing was coming really out. And I remember him announcing in an interview that he was done trying to produce movies or direct movies. He's probably going to stop doing that, uh, maybe just become a producer and stuff like that. So I remember that was a period when Clive kind of lost that starry eye of L.A. and Hollywood. And he, I think he crystallized some of those feelings in uh, Cold Heart Canyon. Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh wow! What a what a gorgeous novel that is as well. I I one of my absolute favorites actually. I think that's that's no surprise in 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 what in the book anyway. Um, yeah. I think you're right in terms of this, and I think that's what Harvey in 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 his piece on Lord of Illusions is 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 also alluding to as well, is that idea of losing that kind of sparkle in your eye in relation to Hollywood culture and relation to, uh, you know, studio systems and things like that and films by committee. I think that the frustration of that, I can understand why you would walk away or take a significant break from that. I personally love Cold Heart Canyon because it's kind of got a bit of everything in it. It's got mm -hmm. the ghost story. Absolutely. It's also got the fact that it's set in his own home, which when I have to say, um, my husband and I were very, very fortunate um, when we were on our honeymoon in, 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 Los, An in Los Angeles there uh, five years ago. Um, we were invited up to, to Clive's house. I was telling him about this project. And I remember walking around just going, oh, my God, Cold Heart Canyon. I remember whole sequences, <laughs> whole chunks of this book and photos that I had seen in the 1990s as a fan and just going, this is incredible. Because the fact that so much of it is set in his home, it does take on this um, autobiographical quality in, in the novel, I would argue. Right. So there and are the moments where he lived uh, was designed by a former movie star, I believe. Yes. From the 20s. Yeah, that's right. So you feel that um, those whole descriptions, those passages when we're looking at uh, the, the, the Hollywood parties of the, uh, the, the, the 30s, I think, in the novel, you know, when they're talking about, you know, the sex parties and, and right. these kind of cavernous spaces, you do kind of you can kind of start to imagine how it has mapped on into his the evolution of his home in the novel. I can see how he kind of imagined mm -hmm. the architecture of it and the spaces and how they became sort of supernaturally inflected. Um, right. But I love that novel because that novel talks about, okay, it talks about real Hollywood stars as well and certainly some people who are thinly disguised in, in the book uh, in relation to the horrors of contemporary Hollywood. But I think it's also a way for him to kind of put to bed those demons, that frustration of maybe uh -huh. through the 90s as he moved to L.A. and as he as he found it was a uh, a difficult transition, I suspect, from, mm -hmm. from England. So I think it enabled him to kind of have that cathartic release in the only way he knows right. how, which is a great big novel. So, yeah. And you can't help but draw parallels with certain things in that, uh, in that novel and uh, some of his own life. I mean, there's a whole chapter about um, I think the character's name is Todd Pickett. Is that right? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. And his dog gets sick and he has to take him to the vet and he dies yeah. projectile vomiting. And I believe that that was an actual episode that happened to Clyde with one of his dogs. And, um, and it yeah. ended up in the novel. Um, and also this idea that the Todd Pickett at one point when he thinks he's dead and he's trying to bury himself in his own bedroom. And mm. in some ways I can't help but think that, you know, Clyde Barker did, for a long time, stay 
in his house. He didn't really go out. He was really weak, and he he got through bouts of depression, uh, of which he tried to work himself out of by writing Chile at a Meditation, uh, which is a, a fantastic book, uh, one, one of my favorites, along with um, his book of uh, erotic poetry, Tonight Tonight Again. And, um, and so I, you can't help but draw these parallels of these people who end up becoming famous and celebrities, but they end up becoming unhappy, and they kind of just stay there and just stay in their house and they kind of feel like their time has passed in some ways. And it's, a, uh, it's this strange feeling. I mean, uh, for example, there was that, um, famous, um, uh, famous, um, trainer that was on TV, uh, Rich, uh, Simmons. What was his um, name? Yeah. Uh, yes. I remember the podcast that was out recently. Right. Yeah. You, you yeah. heard that podcast as well. Yeah. So there are these people who all of a sudden they just decide, well, I've had enough of public life. I'm just going to retreat back to my Canyon house in LA. I'm just going to spend my days there doing whatever I want. And they just retreat themselves from personal, from uh, public life. And uh, in some ways that's what Todd Pickett did. It, it of course, because he has a botched plastic surgery, which seems to be something that in America, they even made a whole show out of that sort of thing, botched. Oh, <laughs> um, oh dear. Okay. Yeah, they did. Oh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a show where two doctors in L.A. Uh, fix people who had botched plastic surgeries. And uh, okay. usually you see all these people coming in. Oh, I can't breathe through my nose because my nose is like super tiny. Or, you know, I had a boob job, but now these boobs are like one of them popped. And uh, they have to fix that. So... That's worse than uh, yeah. any, any yeah. horror movie um, that you could watch, it sounds like. Right. It's, yeah, it's the definition of body horror, is it not? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, when you're talking about body parts popping or stitching, oh, God, yeah. 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 And, and these people are rich, uh, and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars changing themselves because they, they're not happy on the inside. And yeah. uh, and so there, there's that... Uh, the reflection of that in uh, Cold Hard Canyon, I, I thought. I think as well, there's got to be, I mean, this could be projection on my part, but I know reading Cold Hard Canyon and, re and, and writing around it again, there is this sense of, uh, I suppose, this frustration that you... Was kind of like what, what King went through to an extent, whereas that you don't seem to like me as a horror writer, you don't seem to like me as a director... I'm not being accepted. Okay, well, then I'm going to do it my way. And if that means that I have to retreat into myself and be creative again and then release my novels or my pa my, my paintings or my films accordingly, I think there's a level of retreat for safety, perhaps maybe as you as you alluded to, you know, the idea of self-preservation, maybe potentially even depression. But um, this idea as well of not being accepted because of commercial constraint and then actually going about it a different way altogether, re-emerging and, and, and creating it on his own terms. Because right. Cold Dark Canyon is such a different novel to a lot of other Barker material, especially around that high fantasy period. It's a very different novel. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why I really took to it, because it reminded me of, of Barker around 1987 again, you know what I mean? As opposed to mm -hmm. post-Galilee, which was still mm -hmm. quite secondary world. So um, it was really refreshing, I remember, at the time. And I kind of... I was happy that he was willing to situate it within American culture as well. Yeah. So there's uh, also essay 11 uh, by Alexander um, Alexander oh, Reyes. Xavier. Xavier oh, yes, Aldana that's, that's Reyes. Xavier Aldana Reyes, yes, yeah. yes. There's an essay that talks about tortured souls in Mr. Begone and talks about the new myths of the flesh. Um, so, again, very interesting stuff here, uh, especially when... Uh, you know, they go into this nature of the demonic uh, body uh, in Mr. Be Gone and how uh, the poor demon ends up being burned in hell. He's a demon and he gets burned in hell when he falls face face into a, pile, a burning pile of his own writings, which, yes. uh, yeah, yes. it's, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> The irony, yeah, right? Yeah, there's the irony to it, yeah. I mean, it's Mr. Be Gone is an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I... Um, it came at a weird time in my life when I had written a story myself about an angel stuck in a book and that's okay. uh, released by a reader. And then all of a sudden this book came out and I'm like, huh, that, I, that was interesting. Um, you were um, channeling, five in yourself, you were channeling <laughs> each other. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I guess I always, because I always, I, for, for a long time I was... Um, I had a side gig where I would uh, buy books in flea markets and then I would resell them. I would clean them up and then resell them on eBay and stuff like that. So 
I, I used to spend a lot of time in old bookshops, especially in Portugal, because that's where I was living at the time. And you will find these like antique bookshops that, you know, there's a guy behind the counter who's like 70 years old and he practically mm -hmm. sells books by the pound. And it's like, oh, if you take all this pile of books, I can throw this, this, this book in there as well. And you can. So I used to buy and sell a lot of books. And uh, and so. I, at one point, I did, you know, write a story about an angel that was stuck in a book, and then the guy who was selling the the old bookseller was a demon in disguise. And then this guy would buy the book and read it and release the angel, and there would be like kind of a confrontation at the end. And then this book came out, and it was like this book came out of nowhere. And um, <laughs> yeah. apparently, Clive just keeps saying that he had this voice in his head that was nagging him, and uh, he wanted he wanted the story to be written, so he did. Um, yes. So a little fantastic book here. And and to me, it was very personal because I, at this time, my, my ex-girlfriend was living in Germany. She was living in Mainz, which was one of the cities that shows up at the end of the book. So okay. I went there. It was Gutenberg's hometown. And I visited the Gutenberg Museum and saw, you know, De Corporis Humana Fabrica uh, by Vesalius. And I was looking at those plates thinking, hmm, yeah, that's that. That came out in the forb uh, the forbidden uh, short film Clyde Barker made. There's like a guy who's skinned and he's like posing in this landscape. And it's I was just making all these connections. And then this book comes out, and I, it was really personal for me because I, I had a lot of cult cultural references I could connect with this, in this book. So I thought it was a, a fantastic little tale. Um, and then of course there was the tortured souls, right? So the tortured souls came out by McFarland Toys, and I believe that. They were more than Clive trying to create something new. It was also because I think McFarland Toys couldn't secure the license to make Hellra Hellraiser toys. So yeah. they ended up just making their own Cenobites, right? Sure, yeah. Make your own versions of it, you know what I mean? Or or, or at least twist around enough of them so that they feel like they are belong within the universe, but not necessarily infringe copyright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel, I, I really love the fact that in, in particularly Mr. Begon, this idea of the compulsion to write the way that books uh, in some ways contribute to our immortality, the idea that they'll live around long after we're gone, but at the same time that they also become our damnation because as an author, you can get typecast. And I yeah. think that again, that kind of, I think he's grappling with all these different ideas in, in it. And I, I think it's a, it's got some really lovely moments in it, and I particularly love that kind of repeated taunt to the reader of you know, destroy the book, burn the book, get rid of it. You know what I mean? It's so dangerous. It's so terrible. Why are you still reading? So, you know, um, it kind of is a lovely way of exercising your demons and trapping them at the very same time. So. Yeah, and, and there's still the inescapable queerness of the relationship between Katoon and um, uh, uh, Mr. Begone. So uh, the yeah. two demons that fall in love and then get a lover spat and then they become enemies and ultimately get together again at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, we, we, that's something that's so revisited in all of his fiction as well. It feels perfectly in tune with it, you know? Yeah. Um, like Swan and, and, Swan and Nick's. And Nick's. Yeah. Great and Secret Show. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, there's a there's there's a lot of frustrations that kind of come to the fore, but we always find that it's always to do with the fact that they love each other really. They just are really, really angry with each other. So... And then there's your your final essay here, the the twelfth yeah. essay, um, the Devil and Clive Barker Faustian bargains in Gothic filigree, which again it's it's just a perfect bookend to this book, um, to the series of essays. It's it's just so amazing how you talk about the Gothic nature that's pervasive in Clive Barker's work, even though people might think of Gothic as their own. Everybody has their own definition of what it means. Some people think it's going to be like oh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, corsets and uh, gothic mansions and stuff like that, and not necessarily. No, no, not at all. I mean, it's something that I have to admit, from the moment I started reading Barker seriously as a teenager, I kept on noticing this Faustian bargain. You have to go through something, you have to sacrifice something in order to experience uh, something greater than yourself. So I, yes, that's a classic Faustus story. Um, so when when I initially was thinking about the conference, I thought, yeah, well, I'll definitely have to do it on that. And I went out to look into the scholarly world and went, I'm sure someone's written this, and no one had. And I thought, well, my God, well, this is something that I just 
see so clearly in his work. But no, it's not a, it's not gothic in so far as some people might think of it as, you know, corsets and castles and whatnot. No, I mean the gothic is really as we kind of try and understand the definition of it is that this is it's sort of a feeling of dread, this encroaching sense of time and space being compressed into something horrifying, this sickening realization. And I, you definitely get that in so much of of Barker's work. Uh, and in and the Faustian bargain in this case is there's always some sort of desire to know more, a little bit beyond what a character can already experience. So right. when he actually goes into oh, whether it's Frank and the sexual experience, the excesses of the sexual experience or whether it's um I'm just trying to think there's so many um a damnation game again this idea right. of Marty being able to you know yeah. but even Marty's ability to be able to to remold and remake himself and, and Mamoulian's desire to go into the in, into the ne- next world with Whitehead. There's so many different or or Harvey Harvey being snatched away or being led away uh, to the hood to the hood house and then yes slowly getting every heart everything his heart desires but at the cost of from of, a to z people. right mr hood offers him anything from a to z yeah. yes exactly yes in that exactly. famous scene so there's a bargaining right there uh, absolutely um and the fact that i mean the real true testament of it being a faustian bargain one as well is that when he discovers the tricks that mr hood is playing on him mm-hmm. the fact that everything so starts turning to ash is a very it's a very, very powerful moment in that in that uh, story because we start we start to see that the food is all turning to ash and all the monsters are turning to dust. It's a very powerful thing because we start to realise that the promises and the illusions of the Faustian bargain they are always formed on a basis of trickery. So right. therefore, everything you see that you think you think is so valuable is actually turns out to be worthless. Your soul is always worth more. So, right, um, right. I'm, I'm very pleased with. I, I must admit, I'm very, very pleased with that one because I found that. It was just such a repeated motif and such a strong one. And it's it's really um, at the heart of so many Gothic stories, whether they're old or new. Um, so, well, Clive, and I, I'm confident Clive would reject the title Gothic. Um, I think in the, in the traditional academic sense of the word, I think he most certainly does conform to uh, Gothic ideas and styles, even if it goes into different genres like fantasy or, or horror. Yeah. And, uh, for example... Um like you said, um, all this, the, the, and I was, I was, um, I, now I'm wondering if I got into Clive Barker because I liked Gothic stuff, because I grew up reading stories like, uh, um, M- M.R. James, Henry James, uh, yeah. Sheridan Le Fanu, um, you know, all that good stuff from, you know, the, the, the Gothic horror, uh, uh, stories from England. Uh, I grew yeah. up on all that stuff. And, and that's another thing I wanted to get back to. You mentioned uh, the anthology that came out in 1998. Uh, uh, oh, the essential collecting. Work. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's such a great gateway uh, to get those, that sort of anthologies um, for for any genre, really. I mean, um, I know Paul yes. Kane and Mary O'Regan. They they've been doing lots of uh, anthologies. They've edited a lot of anthologies, and uh, yeah. those books are so priceless for. Um, not just people growing up, but even adults, you can find out so much, uh, so many more authors out there that you wouldn't be exposed to otherwise when you buy one of those anthologies. And so uh, I think uh, Clyde Barker mentions the Pan Book of Horror Stories, I believe, yes. and, and, and Dark Forces. Impressed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and I, I, I think the thing that put me on this on the path to gothic stories and and me loving horror stories uh was probably mr james ghost stories uh, i had this book with all these stories in there and uh it's it made such an impact on me i don't know if you ever read those uh mr james I ghost stories Actually, Daryl Jones, who uh, did the essay on uh, Visions of Albanon, has have, has also um, released an edited uh, anthology of M.R. James uh, with oh. Oxford University Press about, I want to say, about two years ago. But it's mm-hmm. absolutely exquisite stuff. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us do appreciate that sort of anthologization of different writers because it brings out material that you might know or you might have read as a kid, but also stuff that you might not know, like lesser known stories or stories that need to be kind of brought back into the public imagination. Um, my colleague Xavier has done that with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Lovecraft and uh uh, you know, uh, he 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 looks at these sort of um, 
classic stories, but also how these classic stories are so important to our understanding of the Gothic and horror. So there's there's so many um, different writers to discover and to, to to reclaim. So I think that, you know, I think you'd be, you're much more into the Gothic than you might know it. <laughs> I think it's just that it might have been yeah. mislabeled for you or you might have been thinking it might have been a very dusty old sort of fiction, but actually, no way. I mean, Gothic is up to date with a vengeance. The only difference, I think, between Gothic and horror that you really couldn't kind of bring Clive in under is that by the end of horror, usually with someone like Stephen King, for instance, you will find that, you know, the world is restored and order is kind of brought back together again. Whereas with something more Gothic, you might never get rid of the monster. You know the monster exists. He's only been temporarily vanquished, like in right. Hellraiser. You know, you know they can come back. That's the whole point. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, gothic gothic studies is alive and well. I can I can honestly say, and I think that I think that Clive has been underestimated in that value. But uh, I'm doing my damnedest to make sure he gets his recognition for it because he's a uh, he's a very important voice in the field. And now we have um, a Nightbreed TV show pilot is being made uh, as we talk. Yeah, so who knows what's going to happen with that. I hope that uh, we get to see more Clive Barker content in the future. I, I hope so, too. I mean, I, I would really love to see more adaptations of his work as well. Um, you know, I live in hope of that um, adaptation of Thief of Always. I live in hope of that adaptation of Weave World eventually into a, into a TV series. I know that was that yeah. came up in, a few years ago. I don't know if that's that's still taken, uh, if it's still being considered. So, you know, long live the Barker in the best sense of the word. You know, hope, hopefully we'll have hey. much more uh, to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Um and you, you can tell the gothic is still alive and well. I mean, Netflix made this show recently called The Haunting of Hill House. I don't know if you've oh, had a yeah. chance to watch I it. I did watch it. I did watch it, yeah. I preferred the Shirley Jackson original novel, but yeah, I did enjoy it for the most part. I thought it was uh, was interesting. And it was interesting to return to Shirley Jackson as well, who's such yeah. a powerful voice in American fiction. Um, and, and Clive Barker's A through Z of Horror does include a chapter about Shirley Jackson as well. So you can tell that Clive really well, enjoys that. Do you know what, guys? It would be so amazing if they if they could eventually convince the BFI to release that on on DVD. Because oh, well, I, I was enough. I was fortunate enough to our our library to be able to to watch that on DVD because someone had transferred it from videotape, so it mm -hmm. had all the priesting and gorgeous kind of gothic destruction of videotape on it. I think it would be just so amazing to make that available because it's such a treasure trove. Those those uh, six episodes. It was really exquisite. Um, it would be great if we could get them to release that in some yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, they're right. You can kind of find them on YouTube, but they're not very good quality. They're hard, hard to watch. And sometimes the audio is taken off if there's been a, you know, a query around um, ownership of copyright and things like that. So, oh. I, they are good. You can watch them, but again, it would be love. Wouldn't it be lovely to have those on DVD? Yeah. It would be really oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's some confusion on uh, Phil and Sarah's website that there might have been a different episode that was aired somewhere in Germany, and I was wondering about that. It's it's so hard to find. All we could find were these bootleg uh, DVD sets that are obviously transferred from the. Uh, uh, videotape. Uh, you can still sure. see like the BBC um, uh, or the Channel 4. Was it Ch Channel 4 or BBC that uh, aired that? Uh, I have it from BBC. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's the one that I, I had seen with BBC on right. it. So I, yeah. I don't know about Channel 4, but... Uh, you know, um, I just remember at the time, like, isn't that so? Another another thing that Clive can do to introduce us to all these big concepts of gothic and horror cinema through the medium of sort of a brilliant TV show. And he also ends it on the Faustian bargain. So, you know, he's he's well clued in as to what he's doing and to how important some of the big themes of his books are. So yeah. uh, I'd love to, I would just love to see those released personally. That would yeah. be a for me, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I learned a lot from Dark Imaginer, and I do recommend this book to everybody who's a Clive Barker fan. And uh, it's it it sounds more intimidating than it really is when you start reading it. There might be some concepts, if you're not an academic, that may be a little hard to understand. Um, but for the most part, it's just confirms what a lot of Clive Barker fans feel about his work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that's you know clearly easy to take in. And uh, I really had a, a great time, and I think the most important thing I can say about Dark Imaginer is that I learned a lot from this book. And so thank you for editing this book and, and putting it out there because uh, Clyde Barker fans needed an academic uh, essay book like this. 
Thank you. I mean, we want to be an advocate for, for you know, the study of his work. So it's done with the greatest amount of uh, love and respect, but also critical importance. You know what I mean? Like it's taking him into the academic field. So some of the essays are critical of his work. Some of the, the, other, uh, the other essays try and recuperate some of the work that might be uh, underutilized or under scrutinized. So um, it is a dipper. It's I wouldn't recommend it's something that they, people start like a novel at page one and end on page 252. It right. is about dipping into it, thinking about it, you know, getting getting to really get to grips with the novels of the films that it discusses and, you know, agreeing with it or disagreeing with it. That's how uh, good scholarship is based. So, you know, um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to start a really lively debate around this. That's what was That was what was the big intriguing idea for me. Where is the best place that someone can buy it right now? Um, with it being a paperback, pro I would think probably either from the Manchester University website or indeed you can probably, I am hoping you can get it on Amazon.com. You can. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it on the UK, Amazon UK right now. They say there's only two copies left in stock, but hopefully they'll get more soon. Uh oh, you gotta yeah. hurry. Yeah. You know, big plaques and sound. They'll, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Manchester University Press will have no difficulty in filling up more or orders on it. Um, it's still, there was a couple of copies available on hardback, um, uh, you know, that might be still knocking around on Amazon, but for the most part, it's just as beautiful in paperback and obviously a lot cheaper. So, uh, if people are interested in that, there's also some beautiful illustrations in it. Just uh, just to let you know, um, there's uh, 19 different uh, sets of illustrations in it. Some of them by Clive, uh, some of his sketches, which uh, he was incredibly kind to uh, to offer me um, to use for the book, uh, and some images, obviously from the films and some of from the graphic novels as well. So um, yeah, it's it's a treasure trove. Well, this was a delight. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this episode featured Dr. Sor Sorkin Nilane. Yes. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay, Sorkin, Sorkin Nilane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Senior Lecturer of Film Studies and American Studies in the Manchester Metropolitan University Department of English. And you can tweet at her at, at Vampire Sorcha. Um, yeah. And go get the Dark Imaginer paperback because it really is something that you can take lots of hours of enjoyment and it, it's a book that you have to digest that's why we were supposed to bring you in on episode 200 but then we decided to take two more weeks so we could properly digest this essay book and uh i'm so glad we did so thank you so much for being with us today thank you all so much really appreciate it and this podcast having no beginning will have no end you can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.